Let's talk about two of the guys in Tony Spilatro's Hole in the Wall gang. We'll start with uh, Fat Herbie Blitzstein. He was, it was nothing that marked him uh, for gangdom. He was born to a working class, respectable Jewish family in Chicago. He grew up to be a big boy. He's well over six feet tall, 300 something pounds. And he got into the rackets in the 1950s, late 50s. Actually, an entire generation of hoods came in around that time. But he would hang around at the Tradewinds Bar, which was a notorious mob bar. I'm shocked nobody's done a book or a, a TV thing about the Tradewinds. Amazing place. Anyway, so he becomes close to this guy named Henry Kushner, who's a mob associate bookmaker. Uh, somebody ratted Kushner out, I wonder who, and he goes to prison. Uh, for running this massive bookmaking operation. Blitzstein takes over his clientele list and he finds out that he's got a partner, uh, Kushner's partner, a guy named Booty Cohen, C-O-W-A-N. Uh, Cohen was a just a hood. He had a conviction for assault, battery. Uh, he set billing to a fire in 1949 with people in it so he can get the insurance money. Anyway, 1967, Cohen ends up murdered. Uh, Tony Spilatro put word out that Cohen had fallen back on the taxes that he was paying to Spilatro, and so he killed him, of course. What else would you do? It's more than probably just killed him, and now he and Blitzstein run the entire bookmaking operation, which was huge. Uh, in 1976, Blitzstein gets convicted for running illegal operations citywide. He gets sent to prison. And when he's released, he finds out Spilatro's in Las Vegas, so he moves out there to work with Spilatro as part of the Hole in the Wall gang. Hole in the Wall gang, the local police gave him that name. They uh, did burglaries. If you saw the film Casino, it's all detailed. And they did burglaries, and they'd punch a massive hole in the wall, in the, or in the ceiling sometimes, and they'd jump in and rob the place. Uh, it was formed 1976 by Spilatro, and it had some legendary thieves in it from Chicago. He brought them out west to do his work. So Blitzstein, he did some muscle work, but uh, mostly he was a fence for stolen goods and he worked out of the gold rush. It was a jewelry store that was actually, he was a partner in the jewelry store with Cilatro and in the front for the hole in the wall gang. In July 4, 1981, the end starts to begin. The gang, you know, Blitzstein wasn't part of this, uh, nor was a, Spilatro and a few others, but uh, the, the gang broke into the Gifts Home Furnishing Store. It, it got all screwed up. A lot of them were arrested. Frank Culato, Culato, rather, I'm sorry, uh, who lived until I'm recording this in 2020. I think he died this year. Uh, he gave tours of mobster tours of Las Vegas. He turned state's evidence. He didn't want to go to jail. So he nailed a lot of people for what he told, but he couldn't get Tony Spilatro. There just wasn't sufficient evidence. But uh, Blitzstein, in a separate indictment, federal racketeering indictment, Blitzstein gets indicted with Spilatro, and it looks like it's going to be bad. And then suddenly the, the witness against him um, has Chicago am amnesia, he, uh, so they have to drop the case. The witness wouldn't testify. Then in 1986, the end came. Tony Spilatro and his brother wake up dead in a ditch, beaten to death. Um, and so Blitzstein is now on his, he's a free agent, which means two things. He's a free agent, uh, which is good for him on the one hand. On the other hand, um, anybody could take him out. He wasn't backed by Spilatro, by the Chicago mob. None of that happened for a while. In 1987, the feds got him on a, a pretty serious credit card fraud charge, conspiracy, receiving stolen goods. He got eight years in prison. And while he was there, he, this... Blitzstein had a bad heart his whole life. For some reason, the prison doctor decides to take him off his heart attack pills. And as a result, Blitzstein has two major heart attacks. And so that led to a congressional investigation. It was pretty bad. In 1991, he gets released. But by now, he's had two bypasses. He's really slimmed down. Uh, he's not this big giant he was. In 1991... Uh, he's a grandfather at this point. Uh, the state of Nevada finally gets around to putting him in the black book, which is actually green, but um, he didn't care. He, he spent almost all his time at a used car lot he had outside Las Vegas, and that's where he did his fencing business. He fenced a lot of jewelry, bookmaking, and he ran an escort service, which is 
uh, surprising to me. Then in late 1996, the LA underboss, Carmen Milano, was working with the Buffalo crime family, and he decides he wants everything Blitzstein's got. He wants Blitzstein robbed, and um, at some point along the way, it's decided Blitzstein should also be killed. It's a long, complicated, convoluted story. It involved 12 people. I mean, this guy ordered this guy, who ordered that guy, and it just went downhill. And by the time it actually got done, it was a, a, what the military calls a clusterfuck. It ended up that on January, Blitzstein just comes back from a Mexican vacation. On January 6th, he gets up, goes to work at the car lot. A crew goes in, they rob the place. He's got a rented townhouse. They rob it blind. Uh, according to them, they've got dozens and dozens of uncut diamonds, which are really valuable. Boxes of Rolexes, Cartier watches are stolen. Uh, some are knockoffs. Bricks made of gold bullion. Imagine that. And about a hundred grand in cash. But after they rob the place, they leave the side door open. And two killers, Antonio Davia and Richie Friedman, come in. Blitzstein comes home. He sits down in this easy chair, this manila covered, colored easy chair. It's around six o'clock. He doesn't know he'd been robbed. He doesn't know there's killers in it. Friedman walks up, puts, fires a single shot into the back of uh, Blitzstein's head, kills him. And then Davio, for who knows why, whacked him over the head with a baseball bat. I, well, who knows? Anyway, the whole thing had been planned out. It, it, it turns out that one of the guys in Milano's crew, uh, Johnny Branco, was an FBI informant and had gone so far to get two FBI guys on the L.A. crew. So the FBI knew all about this, and you know the indictments come down. But in the end result, uh, nobody really did serious time over this. You know, not really. Uh, Milano died in bed at, a few years later at age 76. Uh, one guy died in prison while he was waiting for the trial to happen. Davia uh, didn't do any serious time either. It just So it all just fell apart. Imagine that. So well, let's talk away. about Larry Newman, uh, another member of the Hole in the Wall gang. Um, not reserving judgment, this guy was, he was whacked. He was nuts. They call him Lurch because he was huge. He's a giant. Unlike virtually everyone in the history of American organized crime, he was born rich. There's another example I can think of would be uh, Arnold Rothstein, who was also born to, uh, not only was Rothstein born rich, but a place of enormous position and power. But So why did Newman go into this sort of crime? He, it was violent, the crime he went into. Why? Uh, he liked it. Uh, personally, I think it was just a nut job. That had a lot to do with it, too. Wait, though, listen to why I say that. He had a prison record going back to 1947. Uh, in Chicago, where he was from. I didn't mention that. Uh, 1950s, he had already done a prison sentence for robbery. One day, he's in a bar. Uh, it's it's a, a jazz bar. I don't know why. Chicago mobsters tend to like jazz bars. Mickey's Miracle Bar, downtown Chicago. Two brothers, Mac and Mickey Epstein, ran the place. Uh, there was an argument. He... This is Newman said he had been shortchanged when he paid his bill. He was with his fiance. He'd been shortchanged by two dollars. Um, <laughs> a fight breaks out, which is he thought he just beat everybody up in the bar. But the Epstein brothers had been pretty lethal boxers, and they're a lot smaller than he is. But they kicked the pee out of him, and then they have him arrested. The police come to have him arrested. He stays in jail for a couple of weeks. He's released May the twenty fifth. So he waits. On June the 9th, 1956, 2 o'clock in the morning, he goes back to the bar. He's got a double barrel shotgun. Just holds it up in the open. He walks in. He goes, I'm going to, quote, I'm going to kill everyone in the place. So everyone hits the ground except Mac, Max uh, Epstein, who was behind the bar. Um, the last thing that could be heard was apparently Newman walked up, leaned into the bar, and, and he's, the guy's pleading for his life. And um, he stood, Newman stood on the rail, so he, he was even higher up than he would be among this little guy. And he shot the 54-year-old bartender in the back when he turned to avoid the shot. He killed him. Uh, he goes to find his brother, Mickey, and 
he shoots, but instead it's a shotgun, so it's an easy miss. It, he it's a sp splatter, you know, a scatter gun. He, he hits Lois Gates, who's a twenty year old, twenty eight year old uh, dice game operator in the bar. She dies because it took off most of her neck. Uh, he's going to fire again, and then for some reason, known only to him, he changes his mind, and he goes to walk out the front door just as he does it. Boy, you talk about wrong place, wrong time. There's this poor newspaper vendor, John Keller, um, who had big, who had family at home, kids, and everything. He opens the bar door and then steps back out onto the sidewalk when he realizes what's happening, and Newman decides to kill him anyway. He just shot him, shot him four times. And he reloaded every time he shot these people, by the way. Um, and then he just walked away. The Chicago police started this, they call him the Grudge Slayer. Well, the newspapers call him the Drug Slayer. Dr uh, grudge Slayer. So uh, the, they made a big thing. He was on shoot to shoot on site orders. And uh, they think he's headed towards Mexico. There's a pretty large statewide uh, search for this guy. It was uh, crazy on June 11th, 1956. It, there's this huge manhunt and word get out that he was at the Granada Theater on the north side of Chicago. Uh, uh, a, a crowd, they say 8,000. How they would know what it is 8,000? It's in a, like a, a residential area, kind of. Um, 8,000 people were supposed to have jammed the streets. The police couldn't do their job. There were 15 squads of cops there, and they're calling for crowd control. Two women fainted, had to be brought to the hospital. The man in the theater wasn't Newman, it was some other guy. But they did catch him on August 1, 200 police found him. Uh, Newman, he had no problem. He confessed to killing Epstein, Gates, Keller. He was fine with that. He gets sentenced to three 125-year uh, terms. But while he's there, he's working in the, in the prison psychiatric ward. Is it not, the record says he's working there. I, I wonder if he was a part of that but you know what I mean if he was a patient there anyway he becomes fast friends with Frank Coluta uh, you saw him in the film Casino as well um, Coluta was a lifelong Chicago gangster and burglar he was kind of sort of the second guy in charge in Spalacho's crew sort of Spalacho's brother was number two and then Coluta had a lot of say in it anyway they become close, close friends. Kaluta ends up getting transferred to Terre Haute and he, to finish out his sentence. And then and there, remarkably, 11 years go by and almost 12 years, and Newman gets a parole. He had to serve at least a third of his sentence, which he hadn't done. Uh, how uh, he would have been 69 if that happened, 69 years old. Uh... His father had a lot of money. Who who knows? It, he got, he walked as awful as that is. He got away with it. So he returns to uh, Chicago and he finds out that uh, Coluto is out in Vegas and so working with Spilatro. So they work a deal, him and Coluto. So look, if I get some good stuff here in Vegas, he tells Newman, you tell me some good robberies will work together on it. And then if you get something to Chicago, we'll work together. We'll split it. So for a while, they're doing great until Coluto gives him a lead on a jeweler named Robert Brown, Bobby Brown. And apparently Bobby Brown usually carries a traveling salesman. He's got, I don't know if they even do it anymore, uh, these sort of big suitcases they used to carry in their trunk, of all things. And that's where all the diamonds were. And they had a lot of cash. because You know, credit cards weren't as prominent than as they are today, so cash. And anyway, according to Colota, he's this jeweler's got between $150,000, $250,000 worth of jewelry and cash on hand at any time he's on the road. So a while later, Coluto asked Newman what, what happened with that, and this is what he said. I had to kill him. When I got in the store, I said, fuck it. I put my gun down and grabbed the machete that was hanging on the wall. I started stabbing him. And Wayne broke a vase over it. Wayne was the guy's right. Wayne broke a vase over his head. Coluto said later, I couldn't believe he turned a simple robbery into murder. 
I said to him he was nuts. I didn't say too much more after that, though. Larry was a very dangerous individual. He feared no one, absolutely no one. If I pissed him off, he was liable to kill me, too. Even Tony, was a, Tony Spalaccio, was afraid of him. I sold all the merchandise to a Jew in Las Vegas. By the time I paid all the overhead, we got around 25000 cash, hardly worth anyone's life. Uh, Larry went back to Chicago right afterwards. Within 30 days, he moved to Vegas. One day, Larry, Leo, and I were sitting in, in the Upper Crust. It was a bar, they, uh, I'm sorry, a restaurant they had opened. When Larry got a phone call, he once he got the call, he came back and he was violent. He said some guy had gotten into a beef with her, his ex-wife in a lounge back in Chicago and grabbed her by the throat. I said, A, she wasn't hurt. B, you're not married anymore, so don't get all upset. Larry says, what he did was a sign of disrespect to me. Ah, the famous uh, underworld. Th I've got to go back and kill the bastard. Well, of course. I told Larry he couldn't do it. It wasn't right. For the next uh, hour and a half, I talked to him about it, trying to convince him not to do anything. When we finished, I felt uh, in my heart that I had succeeded. I got a call the next day uh, from a guy telling me about a big killing in McHenry County. A guy and his girlfriend had been shot in the head in a lounge. The following week, uh, when Larry got back from Chicago to Vegas, I asked him if he killed those two people. He said he had. I told him, <laughs> I told, it isn't funny. I told him I thought he'd promised me he wouldn't do it. And he explained it this way. I thought about what you said, but I couldn't control myself. I found out about this tavern where the guy was. I asked, I went there. I asked the guy why he grabbed my wife's, uh, my ex-wife's neck. I was getting more and more pissed off as he talked. I pulled my gun. I shot him in the forehead. Then I shot the broad. The guy gurgled, so I shot him again. Well, of course. I told Larry that the girl was innocent and supposedly had a couple of kids. And all he said was, uh, to that was, the kids are probably better off now. Whoa. Coluto eventually turned state's evidence on the 55-year-old Newman, who was found guilty of uh, a lot of things, burglary, robbery, murder. Uh, he got life without the possibility of parole. Newman did, and he died in 2007 behind bars, natural causes. His body was cremated, nobody picked it up, and so it was just buried in an unmarked uh, plot by the state.